For as long as mankind has fixed his gaze upon the heavens, the age-old question has remained. Are we alone in the universe? As our tools for exploring this vast expanse continue to improve, the answer to our question comes more clearly into focus. It's now estimated that for every grain of sand on planet Earth, there is another Earth-like planet capable of sustaining life. So, can we truly be alone? I'm going to introduce a man who says there are more things between heaven and hell than any of us have accepted. And I have the witnesses and the documents to prove it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stephen Gould. On May 9th, 2001, 20 military, government, and corporate witnesses held a press conference in Washington, D.C. And these are folks who have been involved in so-called black budget or covert unacknowledged projects. They described a decades-long conspiracy to cover up extraterrestrial visitation to Earth. These unacknowledged special access projects are taking in at least 40 to 80 billion dollars per year. And the study of extraterrestrial technology in covert military programs. And they are sitting on technologies that can change the world forever. This technology would liberate Earth from fossil fuels, environmental devastation, and poverty in a single generation. I didn't believe in UFOs until London Control called us in the winter of 1962 and asked us, would we chase one? Their testimony would make history. I said, well, are you going to tell the public about it? And he says, no, we don't tell the public about this. It would uh, panic the public. This was the most watched event in the history of the National Press Club. We actually did recoveries of crashed saucers. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. It marks the beginning of the global disclosure movement. These discs were hovering off the floor without any visible means of support. They were referred to as alien reproduction vehicles. Fifteen years later, Dr. Stephen Greer opened his archives of documents and interviews. This information was refused to the President of the United States by the Director of Central Intelligence, George Bush Sr. They reveal the true story of the secrecy and of disclosure. There is no evidence I wish to emphasize that these life forms from elsewhere are hostile towards us. But there is a great deal of evidence that they are concerned with our hostility. This is that story. Four, three. of UFOs does exist, and it must be treated seriously. Mikhail Gorbachev. One of my biggest disappointments over the last 25 years is those who lack the courage of their convictions. If 1% of the people who I've talked with, met with, or briefed had that courage, this would have all been fixed long ago. I have always told them, if you won't do it, I will. So here goes. For all I know, we may be visited by a different extraterrestrial civilization every second Tuesday. But there's no support for this appealing idea. The extraordinary claims are not supported by extraordinary evidence. 
<laughs> it's always asked, where's the evidence or where's the beef on the UFO issue? In fact, we have so much evidence that Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was in charge of Project Blue Book for the Air Force, stated that it's an embarrassment of riches. We have so much. I'm Richard Doty. I was assigned as a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations at Kirtland Air Force Base. I was a counterintelligence officer at the base. During my time there, my first few months there, I was briefed into a special access program involving the U U.S. government's investigation and contacts with extraterrestrial, the visitation of these extraterrestrials to, to, uh, to Earth. I can assure you that flying saucers, given that they exist, are not constructed by any power on Earth. President Harry S. Truman. And it started out with a crash at Roswell. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Roswell's almost become a joke because there's so much myth and narrative around it. But if you look at the Guy Hotel document, was a field agent sent to J. Edgar Hoover. Three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall. Because it's become the number one document viewed on the FBI website after we released this. Now the craft is, it wasn't, it was more or less an over egg-shaped craft. It wasn't uh, saucer-shaped. That particular craft, there were some problems with Number one, getting it on the flatbed to take it up to Area 51. The interior craft was, uh, it, it didn't have any actual levers or flight control systems that we would identify as a flight control system. But they eventually, I think over some time, figured it out. And it was done all by hands. The creatures would put their hands on controls and they'd have this headset on. And this headset would somehow control uh, or, or help them control the aircraft. Well, they did discuss the fact that there were bodies. Extraterrestrial. Uh, extraterrestrial bodies, yes. The creatures were about uh, four foot. Some of the creatures were, were, were uh, uh, mangled, uh, were heavily uh, injured, and their bodies were, were torn apart. There were four uh, aliens aboard that thing, and those aliens went to Los Alamos. And we were told that the extraterrestrial went to Kirtland Field, Kirtland Air Force Base, and then on to Los Alamos. Two pathologists said there wasn't anything in the, in the anatomy books, there wasn't anything in what our medical schools, they had never seen anything like this. First I thought it was a, a child, because it was small. Then I looked at this head and all, the head was different, the arms were spindly, the body it was gray. But the creatures were uh, approximately four foot. They had, uh, didn't appear to have any ears. They only had two orifices. They didn't have ear lobes, they had two ear canals. They had indentation for the nose, very, very big eyes. The large eyes. The fingers had no thumbs, just four, four fingers. Suction devices on their tips of their fingers. You know, the four fragile fingers and the long arm, real short joint. Almost looked like they were uh, nude, but they actually uh, had a very thin but tight-fitting suit on. One was alive, uh, partially alive at the time that uh, this happened. It died in, in, I believe it was 1952. But the, the bodies of the, uh, the extraterrestrials that were found at the scene were in a deep freeze, placed in a deep freeze, and sent to Wright Pat Field in uh, Dayton, Ohio. One of the briefing officers that was taking us around and talking about what was going on, they said there had been over a hundred crashes in that Four Corners area. I just saw it out of the crash. Holy shit! After Roswell, there was a flurry of ET activity across the globe. Dr. Greer spent eight years trying to persuade members of Congress and other high-level government officials in the intelligence community to disclose what was happening but to no avail. So in 2001, he formed the Disclosure Project. What you're about to see is first-hand witness testimony of events over the past 50 years. Many are telling their stories for the first time. 
This is only the tip of the iceberg. As hundreds more have given us their testimony, but are too fearful to go on camera, for fear of repercussions for themselves and for their families. I feel that the Air Force has not been giving out all the available information on these unidentified flying objects. You cannot disregard so many unimpeachable sources. Honorable John McCormick, Speaker of the House. I'm one of those what you would call the high government officials in the FAA. I was the division chief. I was only three or four down from the Admiral. The way it started is Japanese uh, airline 747 was coming from the northwest going across uh, the Alaskan uh, territory. So his radar is picking up uh, a target. He sees this target with his eye, and the target, the way he described it, was a huge ball with uh, lights running around it, four times as big as a 747. The Japanese pilot would say he's now at 11 o'clock, he's now at 1 o'clock, he's now at 3 o'clock. When he would say that, the military guy would cut in and say he's now at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, and he would confirm the position. He said this is the first time they ever had 30 minutes of radar data on a UFO, and they're all itching to get their hands into the data. And if they come out and told the American public that they ran into a UFO out there, it would cause panic across the country. So therefore, you can't talk about it. And they're taking all this data. And I had the pilot's report that came through. And I had the FAA's first report that was all downstairs on my table. They didn't ask for that. So I didn't give it to them. The plane that I was going to be flying in was an F-104, which was the fastest known aircraft to mankind at that time. So we're flying down the Rhine River. We're up at high altitude. And about that time, I spot a bogey at about 10 o'clock over here. I don't recognize the craft. I said, bogey, 10 o'clock. And the captain looked over there, said, well, let's find out. So he kicked it into afterburner, and we went after that, and it disappeared just like that. He says, please, whatever you do, do not say anything about this encounter. It will get me in much trouble. So that was my first introduction to cover up. So everything was going along pretty just ho-hum routine. They dimmed the lights first in the command center when they set a condition zebra alert. Most of the times when they set these drills, they would say, this is a drill, this is a drill. But they turned the lights down this time and they didn't say, this is a drill. We had contact with an unidentified flying object that had entered our airspace. We had it on radar for almost an hour. The order was given by Admiral Train to try and get this object forced down out of the sky, if at all possible, by whatever means possible. What was really driving him nuts was this thing absolutely had con complete control of the situation and could just be wherever it wanted to be just in a matter of seconds. One minute off the coast of Maine, the next minute it's in Norfolk, headed south towards Florida. And after the, we found out it wasn't the Russians, they didn't care who it was or where it was from. They wanted it and wanted it bad. At various times, I loaded and unloaded nuclear weapons, and I was considered sane, so to speak, and able to handle nuclear weapons. But apparently, UFOs are, well, I know that they're well above uh, even nuclear weapons in secrecy. One particular night, uh, we just finished our refueling mission. London Control called us and asked us if we would intercept a UFO over the center of England, roughly in the uh, Stonehenge, Oxford area. We're up at 33,000 feet, and the UFO was down at about 1,000 feet. We dove on it. Eventually, we got up to close to it, and we could see what looked like a cruise ship out at sea uh, with all the lights and everything. Got about, about a mile from it, and it went up into space. London Control said, uh, you can continue on with your mission. Apparently, uh, Prince Philip felt it was a very important. We were invited to dinner at the officers' club where he was a speaker, and he knew all about the fact that we had chased the UFO. He kind of made me a believer in a sense. Uh, I had seen him personally, of course, before that, but when someone of his stature indicates that uh, they're real and probably from another planet, it's very convincing. I believe 
that these ET vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, which obviously are a little more technically advanced than we are here on Earth. Astronaut Gordon Cooper. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by the comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Dr. Greer has been around people with top secret clearance his whole life. His uncle helped to design the original lunar module that put the first men on the moon. In 1961, President Kennedy challenged NASA to put Americans in space and on the moon by the end of the decade. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. The Disclosure Project archives includes testimony from extraordinary individuals who were part of this great effort to explore outer space, including astronauts Gordon Cooper and Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon. Yes, there have been ET visitation, there have been crashed craft, there have been uh, uh, material and bodies recovered, and there is some group of people somewhere that may or may not be associated with government at this point, but certainly were at one time, that have this knowledge and uh, have been attempting to conceal this knowledge. We walked over to one side of the lab and he said, by the way, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And I said, I said, whose? <laughs> what do you mean, whose? Well, let's see, uh, what's that district again? Yeah. Probably worth mentioning. And then he pulled out one of these mosaics and showed, showed this base, which had geometric shapes. There were towers. There were uh, spherical uh, buildings. There were very tall towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes, but they were large structures. And at that point, I became frightened and I was a little terrified, thinking to myself that if anybody walks in the room now, I know we're, we're in jeopardy. We're in trouble because he shouldn't be giving me this information. The crew of the carrier Kearsarge goes into action off Midway Island in the Pacific for the return of a hero, Major Gordon Cooper. The capsule door is blown off and Cooper's flight ends, a performance that exceeded the most optimistic predictions. I was having some cameramen film the installation of a, of a precision landing facility that we were putting in right on the edge of the dry lake. And this saucer flew right over him and put down three little gear and landed out on the dry lake bed. And they went out, picked up their cameras, and moved on out toward him filming. And he lifted off, put the gear back in the well, and climbed out at a very high rate of speed and disappeared. And I was involved in the research and development and doing very classified programs myself. So I knew that we didn't have any vehicles of that kind. The Russians didn't have any of that type either. At that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was made at some other place than here on Earth. We're watching Fake News Now at 11. Officially, the uh, U.S. government ended its study of UFOs in 1969 because it assured the public there is no proof the phenomenon represents a threat to national security. But what if these unknown aircraft showed an interest in our nuclear weapons? A group of more than 150 military veterans, missile officers, security personnel, including many who worked at the Nevada test site, say they've seen mystery intruders over nuclear facilities. In advancing this concept, Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, has become the first aerospace operations center of the Air Force. They actually photographed the uh, UFO following the missile as it climbed into space and shining a beam on it, which uh, neutralized the missile. It flew into the frame like this, and it shot a beam of light at the warhead, which is represented by my thumb here. So this thing fires a beam of light at the warhead, hits it, and then this thing flies up like this, fires another beam of light, goes around like this, fires another beam of light, goes down like this, fires another beam of light, and then flies out the way it came in. And the warhead tumbles out of the outer space. 
And when the lights came on, Major Mansman turned around and looked at me and said, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. And he said, what was that? And I said, it looks to me like we got a UFO. The idea of any explosion in space by any Earth government was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials. And that has been demonstrated over and over. How is that demonstrated? By the destruction of any nuclear weapon sent into space. It was early in the morning. I received a call from my topside security guard. He and some of the guards had been observing some strange lights flying around the launch control facility. And I said, well, you mean UFO? <laughs> I think I use that word. He didn't know what they were, but they were lights. They were flying around. And I just kind of shook my head and just said, well, call me if anything more important that happens. He calls back, and this time he's very frightened. I can tell by the tone of his voice, he's, he's very shook up and said, sir, there's a glowing red object hovering right outside the front gate. And as I was relating this to him, our missiles started shutting down one by one. The Air Force did an extensive investigation of the entire incident and was not able to come up with a probable cause for the shutdowns. The, the missiles are not connected to each other. Having a fault at one site would not affect missiles at, at another location. Assuming that they've always been there, but what caused this Great interest in us, this large incursion after 47. And I remember he thought for a moment, he said, well, obviously, the atom bomb. A one and a half stage, 132 ton ballistic device, now fully operational, after an evolutionary background of more than 50 years of powered flight. Roswell was not the beginning. It was a turning point. We just dropped two bombs on a country. We had a test of that bomb a few months earlier, or a few weeks earlier, in New Mexico. This probably was observed by these aliens somewhere, whether they were doing reconnaissance back then or how they had figured it out. So they came here to, to observe and try to figure out what the heck was that. At the time of the crash, shortly after the detonation of the first atomic weapons, Roswell was the only nuclear armed squadron in the world. If you accept the multidimensional theory, it's highly likely that we've done a hell of a lot of damage. In somebody else's world, they might have even done more damage than we did here. The underlying theme that connects most of the Disclosure Project case files is the fact that these close encounters tend to occur near our nuclear facilities, suggesting that these visitors are deeply concerned with our hostility and the existential threat that we pose to ourselves and others once we learned to split the atom. These are some of the highest ranking military officials uh, in our, our defense program. They're trusted with you know, nuclear weapons, they're trusted with top level security clearances and secrets, but the minute that they start talking about this particular subject, they become pariah. I believe the American people are entitled to a more thorough explanation than has been given them by the Air Force. I think we owe it to the people to establish credibility regarding UFOs and to produce the greatest possible enlightenment of the subject. Former President Gerald Ford. I am prepared to state that I have been at locations where craft of unknown origin that did not originate on the face of this planet was there. I am prepared to state that while I was there, we saw living, dead bodies of entities that were not born on this planet. I am prepared to state that we had what they referred to as interfacing with those entities. Never. Is there any compelling physical evidence? The question is, who are people like Carl Sagan? And before him, Professor Donald Menzel. It turns out that Sagan, in his early career, actually spoke and wrote about UFOs in a way that was affirmative, that it was legitimate. After he was threatened by the intelligence community and blackmailed, he then began to debunk the issue. Skepticism is very healthy, and I'm a big skeptic about 
more than 90% of the information out there on the subject, which the public needs to be skeptical. However, skepticism is not just blindly denying everything that's legitimate. For example, we have 3,500 cases where extraterrestrial vehicles have landed and left physical traces. We have 4,000 cases where they have been tracked on radar and seen by pilots. We have an enormous amount of photo and video evidence and physical evidence. And in our last project, brought out an actual body that is most likely not of human origin. So the question becomes, what is the metric for the evidence? Well, the evidence is actually overwhelming. There's more evidence for UFOs than there are for black holes most of the theories in astrophysics, most of the evidence for most of the medicines you take. I'm speaking now as a trauma doctor. And yet, we have this blockage in the mainstream media and scientific establishment saying, where is the evidence? What do we know? We know now we live in an ever-expanding universe. We know that there are billions of stars and planets literally out there, and the universe is getting bigger. We know from our fancy telescopes that just in the last two years, more than 20 planets have been identified outside our solar system that seem to be far enough away from their suns and dense enough that they might be able to support some form of life. So it makes it increasingly less likely that we're alone. Oh, you're trying to give me a hint that there are aliens. <laughs> of course, flying saucers are real and they are interplanetary. Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding. When I was eight or nine, I saw one of these objects, broad daylight. There was a beautiful, seamless disk in a blue sky, back when the skies were very blue. And I was with some boys in the neighborhood, and we saw this, and I went, oh my God, they're real, we saw a UFO. Now my parents said, oh well, you're just a kid. But I became completely absorbed in this. So my interest in this goes back to my childhood. The Disclosure Project was an accident of history. In 1990, I formed the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence to form a diplomatic corps to make peaceful contact with these civilizations. Because once you conclude that they're real and they're of interstellar origin, the next question is, what are we gonna do about it? And so I concluded what we should be doing about it is not militarizing the relationship, but having sort of a citizen's diplomacy effort, much like the physicians for social responsibility who were going to the Soviet Union to create a dialogue during the coldest days of, uh, of the Cold War. There was no one at the United Nations or State Department or any foreign ministry dealing with it. So we started a set of protocols to make contact. And sure enough, we had some spectacular successes. Holy damn hot shit. <laughs> Thank you. This got kicked up to the intelligence community. So by 1992, I was getting visits from the head of Army Intelligence, uh, people inside the National Security Agency, and other three-lettered agencies. My intention was never to get involved with trying to disclose this issue. My interest was in this whole concept of making contact for peaceful purposes to advance our civilization from a planetary civilization to an interplanetary civilization. That was, that was really the heart of my, my sincere interest. But along that way, you know, and eventually a man who was friends with the director of the CIA, by the time Clinton became president, who said that you're gonna be the first person to brief the director of central intelligence and the Clinton administration on this because they have made inquiries and they have been lied to, which I did not believe. I mean, he was that blunt about it. This is really where I then went down the rabbit hole. So can the government keep a secret this big? One of the biggest weapons in the intelligence community's arsenal is our general belief that the U.S. government couldn't possibly keep a secret this big from the American public. But the existence of the National Reconnaissance Office remained secret for over 30 years. The mere existence of the NSA, jokingly referred to as no such agency, was kept secret until it grew so large that it was quite conspicuous. And those working in the Manhattan Project developing the atom bomb were told that any secrets that they disclose would result in 10 years in prison or an equivalent of a $100,000 fine. Only when the weapons were used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
did the government disclose what they were. Of, of all things, to keep secret the fact that there is this uh, this bountiful option that we have of reaching out into the stars and being friendly neighbors with other civilizations and sharing information, sharing resources, and sharing knowledge and sharing spiritual insights and values. To suppress that information and to conceal it is part of the efforts of a national security state that is threatened by that reality. And so that this is the, one of the ultimate secrets that needs to be exposed. We have indeed been contacted, perhaps even visited, by extraterrestrial beings. And the U.S. government, in collusion with the other national powers of the Earth, is determined to keep this information from the general public. Victor Marchetti, former special assistant to the executive director of the CIA. And in this document, from the Canadian government, the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher than the H-bomb. That was the most top secret doomsday weapon at the time in development. And the second item, B, flying saucers exist, period. C, their modus operandi is unknown, but concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. And then D, the entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. What is more sensitive than the development of the hydrogen bomb prior to its detonation? the UFO issue. A priori, therefore, the entire subject has been managed in a way from the 40s onward with extraordinary secrecy around it. The event at Roswell, because it resulted in the acquisition of materiel that could be studied, it created a, a sea change in the whole national security organization because within uh, weeks of that event, the CIA was formed. Within weeks, there was the formation of the Air Force, which was split off from the Army Air Force. It also led, however, the development of unacknowledged special access projects, which is why Eisenhower, even though he knew about the subject on a fairly deep level, had completely lost control of it by 1961 when he left office. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. You know, because you think of generals and you think of conservatives and Republicans as being very pro-military and business. But he's talking about the illegal part of it. He's not talking about the conventional military. But it's now the military-industrial intelligence complex uh, that are moving bureaucratically toward establishing dominion and control over the entire democratic process in the country and that they're waging war, invading the Middle Eastern oil fields and occupying the oil fields, attempting to establish what they themselves refer to as full spectrum dominance. But we're gonna smoke them out. And so the public has to understand there began to be this bifurcation, that this separation between legitimate national security and military operations and the deep black programs that are unacknowledged. We're talking about the black budget, the deep black, super secret, unacknowledged budget that runs in the 100 to 200 billion dollars a year. I'm being conservative. My 03 budget calls for more than 48 billion dollars in new defense spending. More money for the Pentagon when its own auditors admit the military cannot account for 25 percent of what it already spends. According to some estimates, we cannot track 2.3 trillion dollars in transactions. 2.3 trillion with a T. That's eight thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in America. We're spending well over a hundred million dollars per day on classified programs that have no congressional oversight, no public scrutiny, uh, there's no monitor of these programs. A number of these programs go directly through Congress, totally. When you start going through these documents, these programs start dropping off the radar screen. These are all classified programs within the defense budget, but they don't supply any technical information on the program. And if people think that the Congress and the President actually have a handle on this, they're gravely mistaken. They do not. This is where we get into the structure of secrecy. 
The structure of secrecy is complex and multifaceted. We've been led to believe that we live in a mostly transparent democracy, with the president at the top of the intelligence food chain, a true commander-in-chief. The reality, however, is much different. A shadowy government with its own air force, its own navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. There's secrecy that is legal, and unfortunately, where Edward Snowden made his mistake was by disclosing secrets, no matter how inappropriate it might have been that they were going on, that were being managed legally that the president and Congress and the intelligence committees knew about. A traitor, a traitor to the United States. On the other hand, there's secrecy that is illegal. And these are the unacknowledged special access projects, USAPs, U-S-A-P for short. What they've done is they've formed this alliance among themselves of the industry that makes money by building war machines, the military that uses the war machines and justifies them, uh, and then the intelligence community that is not really an intelligence community, it's a covert operations community armed with military weapons and nuclear weapons and that they're trying to push the boundaries now of establishing their dominion in full spectrum dominance over the planet. And in this document, first document that's on the briefing for President Obama's brief we put together that we gave to John Podesta, this document lists the compartmented operations out of the Nellis facility, what the public wrongly calls Area 51. I gave this document to the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Tom Wilson. Now this is J2. This is the guy who puts the intelligence briefings together for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States of America. And he got hold of one of these compartments and he said, hello, I'm Admiral Tom Wilson. I want to be read into or briefed on this project. They said, yes, sir, we know who you are and you don't have a need to know. You don't have a need to know. The head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So this is where the military have been victims of the secrecy because there are many generals and admirals and very good officers I've met with who have enormous responsibility that everyone, if you polled a thousand people on the street, I think every single person would say something this sensitive they would know about and if they didn't have knowledge about it, if they asked about it, they will be told. That is not true. There are very clear efforts to engage in covert programs and to keep the knowledge of those programs away from people even in positions of constitutional authority. Uh, Dick Cheney, he would have a need to know. They call him Darth Cheney. We're talking about people way up in the defense industry, people who are running the Skunk Works, people like Ben Rich, like Kelly Johnson. So these unacknowledged special access projects do not care what your rank and position is. They care about one thing, Will you go along with their agenda? And this is exactly what happened when I met with uh, Lord Hill Norton. Since my name has become connected with UFO matters in quite a big way in this country, I have frequently been asked by a person of my background, a former chief of the defense staff, a former chairman of the NATO military committee, what the reasons may be for governments wishing to cover up the facts about UFOs. That I believe is because governments fear that if they did disclose those facts, people would panic. The only thing he really wanted to know was, I was head of the Ministry of Defense, head of the military committee for NATO, head of MI5, MI6, why wouldn't they have told me? And I said, well, sir, with all due respect, what would you have done if you'd found out that there was a project that was illegal, engaged in assassinations, that was keeping from not only our leaders and our constitutionally required oversight, technologies and information that would enable us to have a whole new civilization on this planet without pollution or dependency on Mideast oil or what have you. And he says, I wouldn't have stood for it for a bloody minute. And he was just in a rage about it. I said, that's why they didn't tell you. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yeah, Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed <laughs> by a major party candidate.
When we had your husband, President Clinton, on this show, he said, I asked him about UFOs in Area 51, and, and if, you, if you looked in, because if I was president, that's the first thing I'd do. I'd go right into those files and right. see what was going on. Right. And he said that he did do that. Yes. And that he didn't find anything. Well, I'm oh. gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. Uh, yeah, why not? Right? And, and you know, there's a new name. It's Unexplained Aerial Phenomenon. Unexplained Aerial Phenomenon, yep. really? Yep, UAP. That's the latest nomenclature. I so like the old one. I like UFO. I don't know why. Within a couple months of me briefing the CIA director, I get a visit from one of Bill Clinton's good friends to my home who says, they love what you're recommending, that the president do executive orders to declassify and bring all this information out. This man comes to my house and says, they really think that's a great idea. The president won't do it, it's too dangerous. And I said, well, <laughs> he's the president. If he didn't want to be president, he shouldn't have taken on the responsibility and sworn an oath to the Constitution. And he says, yeah, but you don't understand. They don't think that they can protect the president. And I said, what do you mean? And he's sitting at the dinner table with my children. And he says, well, they're concerned uh, that President Clinton will end up like Jack Kennedy. And I start laughing. I really, I mean, I really started laughing out loud because I thought this is nonsense. This is like conspiracy kookville. He says, no, this is absolutely their concern, is that if he pushes on this, he is in mortal peril. Kennedy may have been engaged in a bit of a struggle with the CIA in try, uh, attempting to get more information on the UFO subject, and uh, that might account for his termination. And that morning, in two of the English-speaking newspapers, there was a picture of two UFOs. So I had placed those on his table where he was going to be sitting, and I said, good morning, Mr. President. I sat him down and said, we'd like to have coffee and juice, and he said yes. So while I was getting that, he's looking at the papers. I came back in, President Kennedy says, well, what do you think? I looked at him, I looked down at the picture, and I says, well, sir, what do you think? And with that magnificent grin of his, he said, I asked you first. I said, from what I've learned, we can't be the only living beings in God's creation. And he says, you're right, young man. There is considerable knowledge as far as the actual being of UFO and ET phenomena that we're aware of today. I am convinced that UFOs exist because I've seen one. President Jimmy Carter. When President Carter was elected, I was the legal counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters in Washington, D.C. He called the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, George H.W. Bush, to a meeting and ask Bush if, as he as the director of Central Intelligence, would give to Carter as the president-elect all the information he had on the potential existence of extraterrestrial life and the issue of whether or not any of the UFO vehicles might be vehicles from another star system. And George H.W. Bush refused to give him uh, the information. Said he'd have to go to Congress and get Congress to have the Congressional Research Service at the Library of Congress declassify it to get it to him if he was going to get it. That's, that's a true story. In some of these cases, absolutely, the president has no need to know because he's a temporary employee. He's strictly a temporary employee. He does not have a need to know on some of these deeper black programs within the Skunk Works, within the Boeing Phantom Works, and also within the uh, Black Widow Group of Northrop. Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress, their Science and Technology Division, based on all the information uh, classified and declassified that they have reviewed, the, their projection was that there were at least from two to six other highly intelligent, highly technologically developed, but non-human civilizations just in our Milky Way galaxy. There was deep concern that something this important would be kept out of the, the, the briefings for the president. My sort of coming of age, which was hard, <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's hard talking about this. <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to say, uh, I was a young doctor, asked to do something like this. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm a doctor in an ER, taking care of shootings and stabbings and car wrecks, and I'm being asked to brief the CIA director on stuff because he and the president are being lied.
to. What? You know, are you... I, I said, are you fucking crazy? It was terrible. <laughs> Frankly, it was devastating. I, initially, I have to admit, the CIA director, I thought, to be honest with you, that he was um, sort of picking my brain to find out what I knew, as opposed to really not knowing. By the time the three-hour meeting was over, it was quite clear that the emperor had no clothes. He later denied the meeting had happened for a briefing. This is a wonderful thing. Now, people say, how could he write this letter basically saying that the, this meeting and what I said about it was a distortion of the truth? I said, because he didn't realize there was a, a record beforehand. And thank God, I saved the document that is the original invitation. And in that letter, it is explicit. I talked to Woolsey this morning, and he suggested getting together. There is an active attempt being made at lower levels of government to sabotage Project Starlight, which is the initiative I started and Lawrence Rockefeller helped fund to bring all these top secret people together and recommend these changes to the Clinton administration. And then he says, this group almost certainly has tapped your phones and is aware of most of the details of your plans. Remember, the most powerful people in the world will have a deep, compelling interest in our activities and will use everything at their disposal to effect their objective. Yeah, I thought, oh, come on. This is like a bad, you know, conspiracy novel. Except this became my life. Uh, I think I just became the first president to ever publicly mention Area 51. <laughs> How's that, George? So. Based upon what Jimmy Carter has said and based upon what Bill Clinton has said, that they were refused this information. I believe that is unconstitutional for them to refuse to give the information to the President of the United States. Many of the Disclosure Project witnesses have had a close encounter with another facet of the structure of secrecy. People who did not agree with this extraordinary secrecy and made trouble for them ended up having horrific things happen. He was talking about being erased. And I said, man, I said, what do you mean, erased? He said, yes. He said, you will be erased. If you tell anyone who is not in this room about this project, this bullet has your name on it, and it will find you. Measures have been taken by agencies to terminate people who are, who appear to be inconvenient or troublesome through knowing too much. I've had a hell of a time after I've told this story, but I continue to tell the story because I think it's important for people to understand that this sort of shit goes on in the government. That the government covers up information that we are entitled to know about as citizens of this country. They'll go after not only you, he said, they'll go after your family. They, they were like, look, man, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna just, we're gonna take you off in a helicopter and just kick your ass out, out in, out in the jungle and you're just gonna, you're gonna, you know, we're gonna end you and all this. And they were never there, this never happened. When I asked them at the time, I said, well, I don't know why you're saying this, I mean, it's, uh, if there was something there, and if it's not the, uh, the, the stealth bomber, then, you know, it's a UFO. And if it's a UFO, why wouldn't you want to, uh, the people to know? Oh, they get all excited over that. You don't even want to say those words. And there have been uh, dozens and dozens of, of totally, absolutely important, credible people who've had their careers ruined intentionally by the national security bureaucracy uh, because they tried to come forward and fulfill what they viewed to be their, their duty to report this to their superiors. 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, midnight, 10 o'clock, uh, people would call and start screaming at me. You're going down, motherfucker! You're going down, motherfucker! And he just said, look, mister, you don't go in and start any rumors and rosals. Nothing happened out here. But who do you tell that you were involved in a UFO incident without them looking at you like you ain't wrapped too tight? One night, somebody blew up my mailbox by putting a big load of, of skyrockets in it. The mailbox went up in flames. And that night at one o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, I picked it up and somebody said, skyrockets in your box at night. Oh, what a beautiful sight, motherfucker. 
Interestingly, there was a man on my executive committee who was a very well-known actor and singer named uh, Burl Ives. And Burl Ives, <laughs> he was a 33rd degree Mason. So all of you people who think that all these secret societies, everyone in it knows everything, they don't know anything. And he said to me, he says, we all know that Marilyn Monroe didn't die of an overdose. Boop, boop, be doo He said, do you know why they killed Marilyn? Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. And I said, well, I didn't until I got this document. It's a, a virtual death warrant because she was found a couple of days later. 3 August 1962, wiretap of telephone conversations between reporter Dorothy Kilgallen, who was looking into Roswell and other UFO issues, and her close friend Howard Rothberg. From wiretap of telephone conversation of Marilyn Monroe and Attorney General Bobby Kennedy. Rothberg discussed the apparent comeback of the subject with Kilgallen and the breakup with the Kennedys. This is referring to the fact that Marilyn Monroe had been having an affair with not one but both Kennedy brothers and it was becoming conspicuous so they broke it off. Rothberg indicated in so many words that she had secrets to tell, no doubt, arising from her trysts with the President and the Attorney General. One such secret mentions the visit of the president at a secret air base for the purpose of inspecting things from outer space. Now, this is 1962. Kogan said that if the story is true, it would be a terrible embarrassment for Jack and his plans to have NASA put men on the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The subject repeatedly called the Attorney General and complained about the way she was being ignored by the President and his brother. Subject threatened to hold a press conference and would tell all. It's a tragic situation because she was an actress. She didn't understand the national security state and the viciousness of those who want to keep these sort of secrets. The, the aliens won't list. let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> you reveal all their secrets. <laughs> they, 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 they exercise strict control over us. <laughs> now, you know, there are a lot of people that are going to examine your, your facial expressions here, um, every, every twitch, everything, oh, no. and say, and of course, so did you look? Did you see? Did you <laughs> explore? I, I, I can't reveal anything. Oh, really? <laughs> because President Clinton said he did go right in, and he did check, and there was nothing. Well, you know, that's, that's what we're instructed to say. <laughs> One of the most powerful elements of the structure of secrecy has to do with the infiltration and control over mainstream media. It's a media of police, a media of police. The whole media is controlled by a few corporations thanks to deregulation by the FCC. Disney, Fox, Westinghouse, and good old GE. They own networks from CBS to CNBC. They can use them to say whatever they please and put down the opinions of anyone who disagrees. We observed firsthand the intelligence community influencing the media when they're trying to cover this story. We have memoranda after memoranda after memoranda citing the psychological warfare and propaganda value of the subject. This is a very important thing for the public to understand. How do you keep something secret? You hide it in plain sight. And I suspect that uh, unless uh, uh, the Defense Department proves us otherwise, that it was probably uh, some form of an alien spacecraft. And I think as a public figure, you have to be very careful about what you say because uh, people can have pretty uh, emotional reactions. And, and, uh, and I said my goal wasn't to try to stir the pot. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. Don't get him too close to me, please. <laughs> In the alien costume, the governor's chief of staff. And this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> so it's there. Everyone, I mean, there's 5% of the U.S. population have seen these objects. But you create an environment where the subject is so pilloried and ridiculed that no respectable scientist or doctor would want to be identified with it. Internal documents from the Defense Department and intelligence agencies explicitly stating that they, they want to have this campaign of ridiculing and destroying the credibility of completely credible, completely honest eyewitnesses to UFO sightings and even sightings of extraterrestrial beings on the ground that they want them discredited. They want their credibility destroyed. If someone comes out and says, I saw a UFO on TV. The only ones that see a UFO in the TV programs are the rednecks 
out in the country that uh, that are going coon hunting or, or alligator hunting at night, you don't find uh, anybody with any kind of spots or, or uh, some professional individual saying, hey, uh, last night, let me tell you what I saw. And this officially was released by the CIA, talking about how they have people embedded in all the major media to change, alter, and affect stories to their benefit. You are fake news. So every news uh, agency, uh, every television, radio station in the Albuquerque or Santa Fe area had our snitches in there. So we knew, and we paid them. We paid them good money. One of the, good, one of the reasons you get the people is you pay them. And, uh, and that was controversial. That, that was somewhat controversial. Do you know of national media that have had Oh, similar? yes, yes, yeah. I'm not gonna name them. We now have relationship with reporters from every underlined major wire service, newspaper, news weekly, and television network in the nation. In many instances, we have persuaded reporters to postpone, change, hold, or even scrap stories that could have adversely affected national security interests or jeopardized our sources and methods. And it goes on to then to say that they have the same within academic circles. There's a finding that the, the Pike Committee made that they had, they had verified 42 full-time Central Intelligence Agency paid employees that were inserted inside the major national news media centers. And most of them ended up being the so-called national security reporters. The man turned to me, and this is a board member of Time Life, and said, Dr. Greer, we basically are scribes taking dictation from the right hand of the king. The fourth estate is dead. I know reporters for Time Magazine who've told me specifically that they've provided the stories and their editors have spiked them. Yeah, the high level. Producers and directors, yeah. And were they, how were they paid? So that it Cash. Yeah, you pay. What you do is you make them sign a form and you tell them, you gotta report this to the IRS. But whether they do it or not, you, you know, you're, you're not gonna give your form to IRS. I paid, I paid, uh, I better not say. There were, some of them are large. If you, Ms. McLean, know of any proof about aliens, you can give it to me and I guarantee you I will get it out. But I am skeptical. Based upon my experience representing NBC and, and representing the New York Times, I know that they will refuse to, to publish information, which in my judgment is clearly important information for the public to know. The corruption of the media means that you have then undermined democracy and our uh, basic constitutional protections. Because if you control the information flow through the elite media, and the only place you can get this information is through the tabloids, where they want it, because it's discredited there, or on the internet, where there's so much false information that's mixed in with the real information that you don't know what to make of it, there creates this complete confusion. When you go to a supermarket checkout, and you look at the tabloids, what you may be reading there are actual stories of actual events, but when it's portrayed through the tabloids, it gets discredited. And they're ridiculed and their careers are destroyed, uh, pursuant to a very specific self-conscious official program. Now this has worked for 50 years. Why would they change it now? This is the technique they've used. It is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. I urge immediate congressional action to reduce the dangers from secrecy about unidentified flying objects. CIA Director, Vice Admiral, Roscoe Hillenkeeper. And so we're sort of living in a Truman Show here. Everyone thinks we have a free press. We don't. We have a, a democratic process where all these sort of sensitive issues would be handled legally. We do not. And that we have an uncorrupted scientific establishment, which we do not and which we will prove. The structure of secrecy 
extends to the scientific and academic arenas, where a deliberate effort to spread disinformation has been going on for decades. From professional debunkers to CIA-funded committees, our trusted academics and scientists have been complicit in the secrecy. A lot of people see something, and a lot of people see things that are really they can't identify, but that doesn't mean they were, it's quite a leap. I believe that people report seeing things they cannot identify, but I, after spending 25 years, I've found not a shred of evidence that we have alien visitors in our skies. Uh, but look, look, this would be the greatest discovery in the history of science. NASA would be elated. Of course, they'd go to Congress to get more funding. Why would anybody cover this? Up? Let's, do, let's, do, let's, let's do this other little thought experiment, everybody. Are you going to do this with baking soda and vinegar, Bill? In 1952, Project Blue Book was launched by the U.S. Air Force to allay fears from the public of ET activity and to assure them that they were doing everything in their power to look into this. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. There's been a decision made within the national security state infrastructure to ridicule and dismiss cases that they know positively are cases of genuine sightings of UFOs and extraterrestrial beings. That's perfectly clear. Project Blue Book was headed up by Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a professor of physics and astronomy at Ohio State University. And Hynek eventually came clean and said we were there to debunk these cases, not to get to the truth and tell the public. And I know the, the, the job they had. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. And I saw it in my own eyes happened that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which is quite a few, they made point of that and, and let that out to the media. Cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, the media away from them. They had a job to do to keep the public from getting excited. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. In response to Project Blue Book, an academic committee was formed in 1953 called the Robertson Panel, comprised of some of the most respected physicists and astronomers of the day. The Robertson Panel was tasked with providing a fair and independent academic analysis of the UFO case file. And in this document, it says point blank that the people who are on this committee are answering and working with the CIA, but that can't be disclosed. And these are esteemed scientists in academic university settings. It says point blank when there's a very strong piece of evidence. We need to set up something so we release certain type of balloons and film it so that it will look like that to sort of debunk it. And we need to engage astronomers and amateur astronomers and set up a sighting situation where we show them some evidence and then show them how it's debunked. Fast forward to 1968. The Condon Committee was formed, led by Dr. Edward Condon, a professor of physics at the University of Colorado. Now, ostensibly, this was an objective scientist who was heading up a committee to tell the truth, because I'm a scientist. These guys are scientists second. They're humans first. And it says it cannot be allowed to be known that Dr. Condon et al. are actually working with the CIA for these psychological warfare and spin factors. I concluded that this was not an objective study. So I uh, wrote a letter to Condon, and he was so furious at that that he called up James S. McDonald, who was at that time the, the chairman of the newly merged Douglas and McDonald aircraft companies, and tried to get me fired. This is in these documents. It is, this, this is not a theoretical case. This is why I say you form a committee 
when you want to kill something. I must admit that any favorable mention of the flying saucers by a scientist amounts to extreme heresy and places the one making the statement in danger of excommunication by the scientific theocracy. Frank B. Salisbury, Ph.D. from the very first meeting I, I had with the director of Central Intelligence. I didn't need to convince him that the UFOs were real. I mean, in fact, I pulled out all this dispositive evidence that Carl Sagan would want to see. And he said, I already know this is real, but I want to know why I, the CIA director, James Woolsey, and the president of the United States aren't being told anything about it. The why is always the hardest question to ask, and nobody asks it. And I began to explain to him what it really is, it's a big technological question. We have lost a hundred years of evolution on planet Earth. A true lost century. Huge progress was made in the 1920s as Nikola Tesla developed energy generation technologies that could power the Earth drawing endless free energy from the so-called empty space around us. So-called empty space isn't really empty at all. It's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. The amount of energy in a cubic meter of space-time was 10 to the 26th power. It's a 10 with 26 zeros behind it, joules per cubic meter. And that's enough energy, even in a coffee cup, to boil all the oceans of the Earth completely away into steam. The acronym Unidentified Flying Object is a deliberately obfuscating term. And what it really is, is an alternative energy and propulsion system. They had a, a piece of, they thought was plexiglass, a rectangular piece of a plexiglass, for years before they figured out it was the energy device for the craft. And it was connected in such a manner that this device could power a very small watch up to a city. Power was determined by what the demand on it was. And so each craft had one of these. The implications of free energy go far beyond keeping the lights on in your home or running your car without gasoline. Most of the cost of making anything from growing food to constructing a skyscraper is the energy used to mine the raw materials out of the ground. Ship, process, ship again, package, and deliver. A free energy society in which the cost of manufacturing and agriculture move towards zero would mean endless abundance for everyone on Earth. They already exist. It's not like they even have to be invented. You and I, the taxpayers, have already paid trillions of dollars, literally, in super secret black budget funding to develop these systems. This is the society we could have had a century ago. We could get rid of smog, we could get rid of pollution, 
Uh, you wouldn't even need solar panels at this point. We could change transportation in a, in a microsecond. The way we build homes would be completely different. The way we govern our lives would be completely different. And all the literally hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets that are in coal, natural gas, uranium, nuclear power, public utilities, they're all obsolete. Many people would say, well, doesn't that mean the secrecy has been a good thing? I said, well, that would be like saying we should have never come out with the automobile because the horse and buggy manufacturers would have gone out of business or come out with computers because royal typewriters didn't get ahead of the curve and they went out of business. When we go outside and we look at our cars, we look at our airplanes, we're already looking at dinosaur technology. It's laughable where we are right now. We should be at least 100 years ahead of where we are right now. And there are still files on this issue classified top secret from 100 years ago for the same reasons. Because the macroeconomic order of fossil fuels, petrodollar, a handful of industrial elites and corporations be completely transformed. But the folks who actually call the shots in the multi-trillion dollar global economy, they don't want to see that happen. They know that if that power was you know, delineated to the average person, we wouldn't need them anymore. They don't want it today, and the likes of J.P. Morgan and others back 100 years ago didn't want it. When they found out that Tesla had passed away in the Hotel New Yorker, they came in, they had the manager of the hotel open the safe, and they took all of Tesla's papers. And this was to the director of the FBI from the Department of Defense in a turf war trying to get that information and lock it up. This is not a contested document. This has been officially released. A century of artificial scarcity has produced a destabilized, dehumanized, war-torn world, where the power and wealth have been transferred from the many to the hands of the few. If you take that on, you're going to run into the mother of all buzz saws uh, in terms of the national security state. Some of the breakthroughs in the past have been deliberately suppressed. There are 5,135, I believe it is, patents that have been confiscated under national security seizures. Now these are just the patents, and this is what happened to a lot of the huge breakthrough technologies like Stan Meyer, who had a car running on water. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. A lot of people don't realize that Stan Meyer had a toroidal, a donut-shaped object that put out many times more energy than you had to put into it because it was tapping into this zero-point quantum vacuum energy field. That had a national security order on it before he even got it to patent. It was seized and shut down. What we really had was a threat to the scientific establishment. I view this as the greatest strategic threat to survival of the United States and, in fact, of civilization itself. Who's going to stop this from happening? The president doesn't know it's occurring. The Congress oversight committees have no idea what's going on. And you have these people who are in the deep national security state who basically do what they want. The problem is most of these inventors think that the world's going to beat a path to their door. Unfortunately, Murder Incorporated beats a path to their door first. But free energy technology was only one half of the equation when it came to advanced extraterrestrial technology. Early research into anti-gravity technology gained momentum in the 1940s, as Adolf Hitler poured tremendous resources into developing his secret weapon, the so-called Flying Bell. Once we acquired these technologies, they were augmented with the study of retrieved extraterrestrial craft, and we created our own fleet of so-called alien reproduction vehicles. This is where Bell Labs was involved. This is where General Electric was involved. This is where a number of high-tech companies gained their knowledge. Lockheed Martin Scuck Works and EG&G and Raytheon and E-Systems and MITRE Corporation 
and Booz Allen Hamilton and on and on and on. I know many people who've worked in these programs. Quote, we have things flying in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what you could comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. So that's coming from Ben Rich. Ben Rich headed the Skunk Works between 1975 and 1991. This is the original letter from Ben Rich on uh, Lockheed Advanced Aeronautics Company letterhead. I am a believer and so is Kelly Johnson. And here it says, Dear Ben, there are two categories. A, man-made UFOs. B, extraterrestrial UFOs. Dear John, yes, I'm a believer in both categories. I feel everything is possible. Many of our man-made UFOs were unfunded opportunities. In both categories, there are lots of kooks and charlatans. Be cautious, Ben Rich. We now have the technology to take ET home. Ben Rich. CEO, Lockheed Skunk Works. It is being covered up, but probably not for the reasons you might think. Within the intelligence communities, they have something called ace in the hole technologies. So secret they didn't even talk about it. November 12th of 1988 was their dog and pony show, a classified military exhibit at Norton Air Force Base. And then off in a separate section of the hangar behind a curtain which was opened up once everyone had gathered were three of these so-called alien reproduction vehicles or ARVs. The craft itself was hovering off the floor with no landing gear underneath it, nothing supporting it from above. To see something, uh, you know, travel across 12 miles of airspace in under a second and a half make a couple of right angle turns and not make a supersonic shock wave of any kind, no sonic boom, which I've personally witnessed on a number of occasions. I mean, it's just, it changes your whole perspective. There were some very good folks like Secretary Forrestal and others who wanted to bring the subject out, but in a way where there would be contact that would be peaceful between humans and these civilizations. But there were other people who saw the big gold mine of militarism and war profiteering and the psychological warfare value. Their mandate, repeat, their mandate is to lie, deny, and deceive. There are people who've had uh, experiences with the technology that were not able to handle it psychologically because it just it defies reality. And in this document, the CIA director, Walter Smith, says, I am today transmitting to the National Security Council a proposal in which it is concluded that the problems connected with unidentified flying objects appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. We have to take a step back from all the jargon and all the paranoia in Star Wars movies for just a minute and realize that it's very easy to set up a false flag operation. A false flag operation also known as a false indication and warning, is a military tactic in which you create the illusion of a threat, often by attacking yourself and blaming the desired enemy. It's proven extremely effective at uniting the public around a perceived threat. And this is actually a, a well-known concept in military intelligence circles. We did it in the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam where we exaggerated, if not completely staged an attack on our naval vessels so we would stampede President Johnson and the Congress into vastly expanding the Vietnam conflict to benefit, guess who, the military industrial complex and the war profiteers. U.S. military officials, for example, for, have, have planned through a project called Operation Northwoods back in 1962 to dress up uh, Cuban refugees in, in Cuban military uniforms have them attack Guantanamo base and kill U.S. military personnel, sink uh, U.S. military ships, and blow up uh, shopping centers in Miami, targeting, killing uh, refugees from Cuba to infuriate the American uh, population so that they can invade and occupy Cuba. It's astonishing that anybody would dare to make a recommendation like that, but they did. Then you can look at Iraq concocted all kinds of false information about weapons of mass destruction, which Saddam Hussein did not have, and it was known in intelligence circles he didn't have, fracture that whole part of the world, and now we have ISIS. So we have to realize the machinations and manipulations that go on behind the scenes leave us very vulnerable. And the big one is this one, where they could say, oh yes, 
The UFOs are real, but guess what? They're a threat, and we need to unite the world, like Will Smith said in the original Independence Day. Something you want to add to this briefing, Captain Hiller? No, sir. I'm just a little anxious to get up there and whoop E.T.'s ass, that's all. <laughs> Efforts on the part of a certain element within the kind of ruling structures of our planet to try to utilize the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence as an ultimate threat, the ultimate other bad guys, to justify the national security state uh, dream of locking down and putting under complete control of an authoritarian ruling class the control of the planet and the resources. The nations of the world will have to unite for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the Earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. General Douglas MacArthur. Can you realize that we, that you and I, that all of us, have actually begun the exploration of another world? We have taken the first historic step into our solar system. I am Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was one of the top scientists brought to the U.S. from Germany after World War II as part of Operation Paperclip. He invented the V-2 rocket for Adolf Hitler and became the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket for NASA's Apollo moon missions. In his deathbed confession, von Braun warned of a plot to pull off the ultimate false flag using back-engineered alien reproduction vehicles to stage an invasion from outer space. When von Braun was dying in front of me the very first day that I met him, he had tubes draining out of his side and he was tapping on the desk telling me, you will come to Fairchild. I was a school teacher. You will come to Fairchild and you will be responsible for keeping weapons out of space. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians were the enemy against whom we're gonna build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. The last card is the alien card and all of it, he said, is a lie. A lie. H have you been exposed or did you come across in, in your career and your network um, the, the false INW or, or the deceptive indication and warnings projects related to this? Yes. And what did you find out about those? Um, that's pretty cla That's pretty hush. That's, I, I don't think I should talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's what I, when I briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, that was the main subject. That is, um, yeah, that's very uh, sensitive. Yeah, it's very, very. sensitive, yeah. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Well, the only problem with that is that if you look at the technologies that permit for interplanetary and interstellar travel, it's a thousand times more developed than a hydrogen bomb, which if we were to have a massive exchange of nuclear weapons, would leave most of all life on Earth extinguished. Therefore, how could we possibly have armed conflict with another planetary system for more than a nanosecond and survive it? They know that we couldn't. But it's a way of manipulating the public through demagoguery of fear, jingoism, false nationalism, and creating a boogeyman out in space. Were you surprised when your daughter enlisted? Not at all. She's a born leader. I know I've been taking orders from her since she was five years old. So you don't worry about her? Of course I worry about her. I fought in the war in 96. I know what those things are capable of. But I know what my daughter is capable of. And I know this planet is safer because she's defending it. They could pull it off. They could definitely pull it off. Right now, they have the technology to mimic the form, fit, and function of extraterrestrial UFOs. They have the technology, absolutely. It's seamless, and you can never tell the difference. 
if they do have a false flag invasion, they're gonna use one of these. This is the Hudson Valley Boomerang. This is 1982 to 1989. Over 25,000 eyewitnesses reported this craft. They can use the saucers, the cigars, the pyramids, the triangles as a united coalition and that's how they're, they're gonna do it. We're talking about 150 to 172 feet across for the wingspan, which is the identical wingspan of the B-2 stealth bomber. So the question we need to ask is, was some of that 22.4 billion used on the B-2 poured into this program? It's the exact same time frame when they power up and when they accelerate, um, it looks like a spark off a grinding wheel and you could never know the difference. So if they wanted to hoax an alien invasion, they could do it and they could do it in a way that's 100% believable. They started doing all kinds of psychological warfare entrainment of the public by staging hoaxed events, such as cattle mutilations. Oh, it's a flying saucer who did that. It's a covert paramilitary program, human. So if you wanted to start indoctrinating people into a false threat from outer space that Werner von Braun warned us about, you would start staging events that look alien, but that are completely man-made, that are scary, and scare the hell out of people. UFO encounters are categorized into four groups. Close encounters of the fourth kind include people who claim to have been abducted by extraterrestrials. If you had a close encounter of the fourth kind and you are back, we're anxious to hear from you. Inner stage left, you got these uh, sort of anti-gravity devices with creatures that look like ETs that are actually man-made robotic systems. They're called program life forms. And you start doing select interfaces with the public. We did do that, yes. Uh, OSI did that. There was a special group uh, out of uh, the 7602nd Air Intel Wing at Fort Belvoir that came out and did that. They uh, had these uh, people that had maybe some sort of defects, uh, antinomical defects that were uh, brought, brought in to, 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 to fool people and thinking they're aliens. Yeah. Um, I can't give you any specifics because it's still, the program is still classified and they're, they're probably still doing it. I wouldn't doubt, doubt it, they were still doing it. So they've already got this psychological warfare already embedded into the minds of people to expect an extraterrestrial, not a secret aircraft, but an alien craft. So when they do pull this, they'll already have everything ready to roll. These civilians got onto the base and, and got into something. They saw something they weren't supposed to see. And this group came out and went into their home and scared the dickens out of them and staged an alien yeah, event. Exactly. The government will use the extraterrestrial phenomenon to cover their own deep black programs and so that's the fight that we're up against here. And then it makes it out through the, the movie industry and the UFO lore and the internet and what have you and it starts creating the specter of a threat. from her, you bitch! <laughs> Pardon me, uh, are, are you from Mars? <laughs> it's a moon <new> moon. <laughs> Miss Dutch? It's a moon moon. The fact that you and I are still breathing the free air of Earth is abundant testimony to their restraint and non-hostility. Now the question is, how are these civilizations viewing us? Are they perceiving human civilization as a threat? And the answer is yes. Because I believe we've reached a point where we're a threat not only to our planet and each other, but we're also developing weapon systems that are potentially a threat in space. I just hope that uh, it's not like Independence Day. Yeah, right. <laughs> really, that it's a, you know, a, a conflict. Well, now we have friendly Maybe the aliens. only way to unite this incredibly divided world of ours. 
that are out there, we better think of how all the differences among people on Earth would seem small if we felt threatened by a space invader. That's the whole theory of independence. You're right. You're Everybody right. Everybody gets together and makes nice and, you know. You and Bill O'Reilly would be hiding in a bunker together. <laughs> the most dangerous thing going on on the planet today isn't ISIS. It's not Iraq. It's not Russia. It's not China. It's a out of control, covert group that is not being overseen by the people, the Congress, or the president who have developed these technologies and are recklessly using them to track and target extraterrestrial vehicles. The result of this is that we're in a crisis that is unacknowledged, ironically, because these projects are unacknowledged. What do you do? Do you talk to your congressman? Do you write your senator? Do you march on the White House lawn? What good is that gonna do if the people who run this government don't have access to the programs? They're not cleared for it. So that's just not the direction to go. We better not get this one wrong because this could be a threat to all life on Earth if we, if we are reckless with this issue. We need wise elders that are humans dealing with this situation. And the sociopaths that are in control of those programs can't be allowed to speak for planet Earth and for humanity. Resting power from the hands of these powerful oligarchs and corporations is going to require a revolution. One of the more hopeful events that happened over the last decade was what I call the French Initiative. I get a letter from the Ministry of Defense, and it's dated 16th of January, 2007, urgent. And it's signed by Admiral Pierre Moran. And he was in charge of providing briefings on this issue for then President of the French Republic, uh, Sarkozy. They learned protocols to make contact with these civilizations for peaceful engagement. So here you have a major country, a nuclear power, making a commitment to do this. And we eventually go to France, and under the cover of a quasi-public event, the Admiral and his assistants are there, and we do our, the protocols for contact. And they track ET craft coming overhead at 200,000 kilometers an hour. But what it shows is that governments around the world can actually do a lot if they wanted to, to break the mold of secrecy and do something helpful. And this is the proof that that's happened with a major country. This is arguably the most important UFO document in history. The irony of it is I couldn't disclose it for a, quite a while until that president, Sarkozy, was out of office and these folks were not in harm's way. There was a, an invitation extended from the Vatican to some 40 world scientists to come to Castle Gandolfo outside of Rome where the Pontifical Observatory is. And they spent a week briefing the highest level uh, members of the Vatican. They came out with an official press statement. Extraterrestrial life is going to be discovered much sooner than anybody had previously expected. And for this reason, the time has now arrived for the beginning of a very serious discussion about the philosophical and theological questions that are posed to our human family by the discovery of extraterrestrial life. There are civilizations that we need to communicate with. And I think we've reached that point in our evolution as a, as a human race that we need to recognize that. And the thing that disturbs me is that the U.S is going to be a third world nation in, in that field if we're not careful by having all of this secrecy and refusing to set up any kind of diplomatic protocols as, as I know that you have called for and I believe in very strongly. The biggest event in the history of humankind is the discovery that we are not alone. That there are other living entities, intelligent entities, in this universe or other universes and that we aren't here alone. That's a huge, enormous discovery. 
I think it's long past time to open this up to the public. Give us information to the young people of the world in this country. They want to hear it. They want it. Give it to them. Don't hide it and tell lies and make stories. They're not stupid. They're not uh, young men that will panic. UFOs are as real as the planes flying over your head and uh, that it's time that uh, the United States government started uh, coming clean on what it's all about because uh, there are very important military and, uh, and economic issues uh, that have to be addressed and how can you address a question which uh, relates to a subject that people don't even uh, really won't admit exists. And it's a, it's a mission that we as the baby boomer generation pass on to you. Humanity is at a crossroads. A choice between endless war, war in space, growing poverty and environmental destruction, or a future where we explore the stars, live in peace with each other and our planetary neighbors. The technology is there. The solutions to Earth's urgent and long-term potential problems are there. The technologies will change the macroeconomic system. Because visualize for a moment, you're at your home, all your power needs are being provided from one of these zero point or quantum vacuum energy systems. Your car is running, never has to be plugged in. You then can have agriculture and manufacturing locally that has very little cost to it. And this is not just in the U.S., but in places that aren't yet developed, the so-called third world or developing world, they're going to leapfrog right over the smokestack industries and go to high tech, real high tech, just like they've skipped over telephone lines and gone to smartphones. This will be a tide that will lift all ships. The world will be increasingly interconnected, and yet on the local level, be completely self-sufficient, every village, every home. And this is something that is the biggest change economically in the history of the human race. It's a big nut to crack, but I think that if you could do that, I think that people would stop looking at each other with a certain level of hostility like we do now. I guess it's kind of corny, but it's that bright future that I see that we could all attain if just a few things could be changed. Imagine interplanetary trade, how exciting that would be. You have to adjust your cosmology, you have to adjust your whole concept of, of our human species being at the apex of all bio, biological evolution in the universe. And you also have to, of course, modify your judgment that the entire universe was created just as the stage upon which the drama of the human development is unfolding. <laughs> that there's a lot more going on in the universe than just that. And this is why it's time for the people to lead the whole ending of the secrecy and do the disclosure. As we, the human family, confront the reality of extraterrestrial life, it is perhaps worthwhile to reflect. Was our doubt really due to a lack of evidence? Or merely a lack of imagination? When it comes to Area 51 and whether or not the U.S. government knows of aliens, should Secretary Clinton be elected president? Well, what I've talked to the Secretary about and what she said now in public uh, is that if she's elected president and she gets into office, uh, she'll ask for uh, as many records as the United States uh, federal government has to be declassified. And uh, I think that's a commitment that she intends to keep and that I intend to hold her to. Have you seen any of these documents? You were a White House chief of staff years ago. Have you uh, you seen know, uh, President Clinton uh, asked for some uh, information about some of these things, uh, and in particular, uh, some information about what was going on uh, at Area 51. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the U.S. government uh, could do a much better job uh, in answering the qu legitimate questions that people have uh, about what's going on with uh, unidentified aerial phenomena, and they should, uh, you know, the American people can handle the truth, so they should just uh, do a what thorough is the, search. What is the truth? And and open it is up. there evidence of alien life? 
you know, that's that's for the public to judge once they've seen all the all all the uh, evidence that the U.S. What do you has. think? What do you think personally? What do I think? I think there's a lot of planets out there.